We're actually here for a purpose, but first I want to let the individuals, the very esteemed panel that we have, minus me, uh, talk about who they are and a little bit about what they do so you'll know uh, who's talking to you. Michael? Oh, no, no, no. Ladies first. Oh. <laughs> Marsha. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marsha Anderson Bomar, and the hat that I'm wearing today, uh, what's relevant uh, for me to be on this panel, is that for 20 plus years I owned my own firm, uh, uh, transportation planning, traffic engineering, design firm called Street Smarts. Uh, so I had a lot of opportunity to uh, do staff development and, and explore issues around uh, valuable staff, I guess I'd call it. Um, but I also, in, in the interest of full disclosure, would say I'm also an elected official, so I have the opportunity to look at um, employees, staffing, and uh, issues on the public side as well. Thank you, Marsh. Tim? Thank you. My name's <clears throat> Tim Harps. Uh, for 25 years, I was the transportation director for Salt Lake City. I was asked to join this panel to give a local government perspective. Earlier this year, I retired from full-time employment with the city, and I've been in the process the last few months of redefining myself in terms of wanting to work uh, part-time as a consultant. My name is Michael Sanderson. I'm a consultant. I own and manage a firm uh, based in Billings, Montana. We are what I would consider a medium-sized firm in the world of consulting firms. We have a little over 60 employees between three offices in, in Montana and North Dakota. Um, we are not entirely in the transportation side of things. We also do a significant amount of land development as well as other types of municipal engineering. Um, our firm is a little over 40 years old. I've been running the organization for 10 years. Um, my personal background is I, I, I grew up in the engineering business. My dad owned the firm that I worked in um, as I went to school. I have, my background is obviously in engineering, but then I did go on and get my MBA. And I would say my focus today is more on organizational development and strategy as much as the engineering side. Thank you, Michael. And let me tell you a little bit about the genesis of this session. Uh, how many of you were in St. Louis? Okay. How many of you attended the uh, Managing and Challenging Times plenary session? Okay. So during that session, we were really talking about how firms met the challenges that we're faced with with a slowing economy and, and, and that sort of thing and how they retooled themselves, redefined themselves as part of that. And in many cases, as we all know, some of that involved uh, becoming smaller. Now, some of the firms are becoming bigger again. And one of the questions, which was an excellent question, was, well, Robert, that's all well and good, but I don't own a firm, I don't manage an agency, I'm, I'm a working guy. And what do I do to position myself so that I'm one of the ones that's meeting the challenges during these difficult times? And I'd like to say we gave them a completely comprehensive and pithy answer that was succinct and concise and led to him. And the truth is that's why we're up here today. We're talking about how do individuals uh, position themselves for success in these challenging times. So that's, that's the genesis. That's what we'll be talking about. Uh, we're going to let uh, each of them make some points. We're going to have a little conversation. Then we're going to get you involved. And uh, let's see if we can figure out how we help ourselves help our profession uh, make it through these challenging times. All right? And I can't remember who was going first, who was going first. Marsha. Oh, okay. Marsha's going first. Marsha's going good. first, okay. Marsha always it's gets always to go <coughs> first. Ladies first. It's because I'm short. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what, I want to touch on a couple of things related to uh, the generational differences um, that we were seeing in organizations and uh, some of the things that um, I observed over the years that uh, are both tools and potential barriers for people making themselves valuable in organizations. Um, I'm sure you've all heard lots of conversations about you know, the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, Gen Y, the millennials, and there are some real differences in um, the interest of each group. Um, I'm in the very much in the baby boomer generation, and we love going to meetings. We love, you know, all that kind of uh, intense networking stuff, and we think we're really, you know, we're in the thick of it. We're we're important when we're there. 
as you move through the generations, you know, the, the perspective has changed and um, there's not as much desire to be in a lot of meetings, to do a lot of those kinds of things. Uh, everything needs to be quick. It's, it's the same thing, you know, if you have a, a smartphone and you're not at 4G, you're out of it completely. It's just too slow. So it, the work environment is very much like that. And what, what I've observed is that in the, in the career progression, there's also that burning desire to move as fast as you want the, the internet to be accessible. Um, and it just, it can't always work like that. And so there's some tension, organizational tension, um, for folks who want to advance maybe a little more quickly than is, is realistic. You know, I've been here two years, I've worked really hard, I need to be in charge of not just something, but everything. Well, that's not really very realistic. But what I do talk to, to my staff about is, if you want to earn the job, start doing the job. Find out what, what things need to be done at the next level, at the next uh, kind of rung on the ladder, and start doing those things. Take a little extra on yourself and demonstrate that you're, you're not only capable, but that you have that extra initiative so that you earn that, that job. Um, a couple of years ago, my CFO said to me, um, uh, when I was sitting in the office one day trying to gather my thoughts after, you know, kind of looking at the financials in this, these wonderful economic times, and he said, you just remember, ain't nobody happy if mama ain't happy. <laughs> so when you walk out of this office, you walk out of there with that happy face on, no matter what's going on underneath, even if you have to deliver some bad news, you know, you need to be kind of that cheerleader person. Well, when I reflected on that, not only do I need to do that, but you know, we all have a responsibility for the morale in an organization. And it, it's unreasonable to think that you know, some, some folks at the top level are gonna make everything okay. We all have to kind of pitch in and do that. So if you're the kind of person who can be part of that uh, conversation, who can help uh, find ways to, to make things better, to make them feel better. We know we're in tough times. There is no doubt about that. But that doesn't mean that we can't do things. A group of us from our company this past Saturday ran a race together. We spent Saturday morning together, um, very hot, very humid Saturday morning <laughs> together. But it's, it's those things that, that really bind you together. So I, I've got a lot more, but I want to let us all have a, a first crack at the nut, so I'm going to pass the baton. Great. Very good. As I thought about the, this discussion, I came up with about six different uh, comments to make, and I'm going to list the six, but I'm only really going to start by talking about two of them, and then if the others come up in the rest of the conversation, great. Uh, the first one is empathy. And I just got to tell you, I have found throughout my career uh, that if you can practice empathy, you can do almost anything and do it pretty darn well. And by empathy, I mean when you're having a conversation with someone, I like to put myself in their shoes. When you have that conversation, you want to listen. You want to find out what's motivating that person to have that conversation with you. What do they want to get out of that? And whether you're talking to a client or a boss or even a family member, if you practice empathy, you will find that uh, you will get to that solution to whatever it is very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. In our industry, why I think empathy is so important. Anybody who has a driver's license is a traffic engineer, right? So they come up to you and they don't start by telling you what the problem is. They start the conversation by saying, here's the solution. Well, that might be the solution, but it might not. And so you kind of have to listen, you have to ask a few questions, work your way through standing in their shoes. What is it that they really uh, have as a problem? They already told you what the solution is. And once then you have the problem defined, then you can work through using your professional skills, what your options are, and then go for the solution. And it might be something totally different. The second item I want to talk about, I call be an independent thinker. Uh, we touched upon this yesterday in the session, uh, and I was sitting in, I came late, I'm sorry, I was in the back. <laughs> but I was, I'm not shocked, actually, but 
I was, I was sitting there and there was a gentleman sitting next to me and the conversation was going along saying, you know, if you're an employee, especially if you're on the junior end of this, what a boss wants is you come into the office and you say, Tim, I, I was given this task, this assignment. I did a little research. I figured out there are three solutions here and I really am recommending solution A and this is why. And then you might have a discussion about it and move on. Bosses love that. What you don't want to be is the person coming in and saying, Tim, I got this assignment. What do you want me to do with it? How do you want me to re resolve it? You know, and, and I'd say, well, basically, I think the comment was, if I was the one that was going to have to solve that, I wouldn't need you. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be part of this firm or this outfit. And so be an independent thinker. Make yourself valuable to the firm. And if it ever gets to the point where there has to be some downsizing, you're going to stand out as the person they want to keep, not the one that stands out as, yeah, there are reasons why maybe we don't want to downsize. Maybe we don't want to lose you, but you might be the one that's least favored on that totem pole. Uh, the other four that maybe we'll get into is uh, includes continuing education. I think it's very important that we always keep coming to conferences like this and, and find ways to continually educate ourselves, broaden our expertise so we are more valuable. Another one is maintaining and acquiring licenses and certifications. Again, those are not just pieces of paper, but they are those things that tell your employer and the public and your clients that you know what you're doing, that you're capable of doing this kind of work. And the broader knowledge and expertise you have, the more valuable you are. Another item is being a volunteer. We need to pay it back and pay it forward. And one way we do it is through an organization like this with IT, volunteer to be on a task force, a committee, run for an elected office. You learn so much more and you get so much more value out of those experiences than you'll ever know. Much more effort, much more than the effort that you put into it actually. And over the long run, it pays off. You'll, you'll have acquaintances all over the world. Uh, when you need something, you can call people, call them by their first name and have great conversations, etc. cetera. You know, <clears throat> the final one I wanted just to make is grow your reputation. And quite frankly, that happens by doing the five things that I already just mentioned to you, at least in my opinion. When your reputation starts growing, you find things come a little easier. People start coming to you for advice or help satisfy their needs, and, and uh, you become much more valuable. So with that, Michael. Thanks, Tim. Just, I'm going to back up and as I was listening to them speak. and. Yesterday, when we were preparing for this as a group, um, or maybe it was the day before yesterday, um, one thing we talked about was that we were going to be very candid um, and honest and with our comments today. Because I've thought about that a little bit. When I'm sitting in a group of other CEOs of companies or other managers, we have very frank conversations about the things that we see in employees that drive us nuts um, or you know the, the people we think are rock stars in our organization and why um, but rarely in organizations is there that kind of candor with those employees um, and I think lack of candor in organizations is uh, um, one of the biggest weaknesses of many organizations and we, we since we work with these people on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, we try to make everybody feel nice at the end of the day, but I think in these particular times, we do a lot of people a disservice not, by not being honest about the reasons why maybe they're getting laid off or, or, or what the case may be. So throughout this, I'm gonna challenge myself to be this is, a, this is like we're going to close the door and this is the boardroom for the next hour. And uh, you know, what, what's said here stays here kind of. Except that we're recording except it. That but, we're, yeah, you know. except, that, except that we're videotaping it and going to have put it on it's the It's here internet. for now. It'll be all over the internet. But you tomorrow. get my point. I think uh, we're going to say some things that are 
quite honest. Um, so with that, the perspective I'm gonna try to bring to this is, I said earlier, I've run our company for, for the last 10 years. Um, I have the distinction, I guess, of having led the company through the time of our largest growth to the largest the company had ever been, through the largest downsizing the company's ever gone through, and now an, into a period of rapid growth again in our company. So um, that gives me some interesting perspective, I think, uh, as to as we downsized an organization, who stayed and who, who went. And now as we're growing that company again, how are we doing it different than we did it before and who in particular are we looking to hire uh, as we do that? Um, when we downsized, we didn't just make the company smaller. Uh, doing the same thing with fewer people uh, was not a recipe for success in my mind. Um, we changed the organization drastically. We redesigned it, we retooled it. Um, our processes, our systems, our business model, we looked at it all, our strategy about how we were going about things. Um, in 2008 or so, when we were 100 people and had more work than we knew what to do with, if you'd asked me, you know, how many of these people are expendable, um, I would have been hard pressed to come up with a very long list, I bet, because we were busy and they all seemed like they were valuable. Um, I can tell you when the recession hit and the bottom dropped out of the markets we were in, um, that first round or so of layoffs almost rode itself uh, when we really had to look at who was bringing value to the table. And that's something we'll talk, I'll talk a lot about uh, as an employee, you know, what value are you bringing to the table every day? It was, uh, you know, we keenly looked at efficiencies and where we lacked accountability in the organization in that first round road itself. The people who we let go were those that had the mentality, the, the victim mentality, like, woe is me, this economy is, you know, doing this to us um, and the company needs to take care of me. Um, the, the longing for the past strategy is not a strategy for success. And those people quickly distinguish themselves <laughs> amongst their peers as not really willing to, to help us get through this. Those that had a, what I call bias for action, they're the ones who came forward and said, how can I help? What can I do? What can I, extra can I do? What can I do different? Um, versus the ones who had their head down, don't make eye contact, I hope they don't notice me. Um, you know, it, those two attitudes are, you know, jump out at you as you walk through an office. The ones who are, you know, trying not to be noticed versus the ones that are raising their hand saying, what can I do to help? Um, a couple of quick examples, you know, in our survey group, we have a large survey group. Um, very traditional in the way we went about doing, we were running, you know, two and three man survey crews. We did a lot of construction surveying. Um, and we said, we gotta do it different. We're gonna use technology. We're gonna run a lot of one man survey crews using GPS and robotic total stations and, and that type of thing. And many of them said, no, this is the way we've always done it. This works fine. And kind of, you know, shrugged their shoulders and, and we had to, to make some significant changes. Uh, there were people in our organization that had been with us for 20 and 25 years that I had to let go in order to find somebody who was willing to do it the way we needed to do it. You know, it's, it's no different than a football team. Um, if your offensive line isn't playing by the same playbook as the rest of the team, then you gotta get a new one. Um, that's, it's that simple. The others is I, I call the, the HR leeches, um, <coughs> the ones that are constantly in, in the HR office um, asking uh, four things. Um, it's the 80-20 rule. I get 20% of the people who monopolize 80% of my HR director's time. Um, we notice those things. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it, that's pretty obvious. A couple quick quick things now on, as we're hiring. So now we've retooled, we've we closed an office, we entered an, a, a new market. That market has been strong for us. We're in rapid growth. I've been in a consistent hiring mode um, over the last six months. Um, 
as I look out there, you'd think there's a lot of people looking for work. The talent pool must be deep. It's deep, but I wouldn't say it's very rich. Um, the, in my opinion, the talent pool is weak. There are a lot of engineers looking for work, but here's why it's weak. Most employers did the same thing I did. I kept my stars, and I laid off the people that I could do without. And I expect that people in my position did the exact same thing. And so there's certainly stories and there's gems out there and we've found some of them. But when I go into an interview with somebody who's been out of work, um, who was laid off from a job, my assumption is that you're out of work for a reason. If your company didn't lay off everybody, they kept somebody. So why did they keep them and not you? And that's what I got to find out through an interview process. Um, the A players are still working for somebody else. And so I, I tell people who are looking for work, if you've been looking for work for very long, you gotta be really honest with yourself. Why did they let you go and not the guy next to you? And, and try to correct that. Um, and so some of the red flags are keeping up with continuing education. I don't know how many times I've found people who are looking for work who, you know, things are still rep changing rapidly in our business, technology and skills and stuff, particularly on the software side. Interviewing a CAD designer who has been out of work for, you know, 18 months, well, there are already two versions of AutoCAD behind in their experience. Well, that's, that's a significant training cost to me. Um, things like that, job history, somebody, job hopper in the past, year here, two years there, year here, why am I not gonna be the next guy on that list? Um, and then finally, kind of in the interview process, when people come in and they're, they feel like they're in the driver's seat, they're out of work, they're looking for a job, and they're quizzing me about what can my company do for them versus saying, here's how I can add value to your organization. Um, those are a few things, there's many more, but I'll draw the line there.